Yes, tonight we're going to go into a, a somber meeting, but it has to be done. Because if it's not done, it's going to be done somewhere by someone. It won't necessarily be us. And if the people that causes these things to take place are not righteous, we'll have a lot of casualties. Many of our friends, our income, our way of life will be affected. I've been teaching for the longest, we must grow up. It's not the last message that I could give on this subject, but it's the last one that I have planned because I need to move into Hebrews chapter eight and show the very things that were left out of what we would call the law and what was left in what we call the law to show what is permanent and what's not permanent and that it had been orchestrated and preordained. But if we can't understand that the Most High has set some things in place, we will be a sheep for the slaughter. We will be able to be destroyed. And I showed that. I showed that the founding fathers of this country determined that there were some things that were worth fighting over. Freedom of lands, freedom of property, freedom to be left alone to protect our loved ones and not to be under tyranny was what they were setting up. And then they set up their own constitution that would ensure their freedoms. They set up a social construct and that social construct that they were setting up around, I say around 1776, a little before 1776, let's just say 1774 to 1776 in that time frame. Their social construct had groups in it. It had one group that would be the oppressor. They didn't call it the oppressor. It would call the group that was in charge. And they would set the pattern for the other group that was not in charge. The group that was in charge were the one to be the slave owners, the one that were found in the comp country, and the ones that was the other group, the ones that had no means of power, the ones that had no means of rights were the native black people that were that were brought here and those that were already here. But in particular, with most, I would say with most earnest focus were the ones that they were bringing in from Africa. That they were bringing in from other parts of the world that had been shipped. So the social construct was that the benefactor, the ones that was going to benefit, would be able to have all of the benefits, all of the money, all of the produce of the labor, and they would set the bounds of what the culture would be between the two parties and that the lesser party would never be able to be equal to the greater party. And that was ratified and effected in the constitution and definitely in the bill of rights. But that's not even what I'm talking about in particular, but I wanted you to know that those that were in charge, they made laws they made a constitution to protect themselves, their families, to ensure that their families would be would have what they need to eat, to have clothing, and to have what was necessary to live a life of peace and totally excluded those that they brought in as slaves. And I submit to you that's not the way of the cross. That's not the way of the Torah, nor is that the way of the scriptures. But I know that I can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that what I'm saying is true. Now, what is our topic going to be about tonight? Because I said we got to grow up because those that set the Constitution, they sat down like adults and they said we are going to protect our own. Our homes, our property, our women, our livelihood and our ability to earn income and to have freedom to come and go as we please without having people to do search and seizure 
of anything that we have, they did that in the in what they call the fourth article of the Bill of Rights, that we'll be able to have weapons if we needed weapons to protect ourselves, like we talked about last week in the Second Amendment, and that, I mean, the second article of the Bill of Rights, and we'll be able to have freedom of speech. That There's a lot of things that they gave themselves that I'm not going into. But what are we talking about tonight based upon growing up at the time when we ought to be able to be teachers, according to Hebrews chapter 5, instead of being babies, and somebody had to paternalistically look over us and grant us what they want us to have and give us permission to come and go as we please. When the Most High God has determined that we would be the light of the world, when he has determined that we would be the ones at the city that sat on the hill, when he has determined that we would be his royal priesthood. My question is for tonight, as I just bring uh, somewhat in to showing that it's important for us to be mature if we're going to affect the cause of the kingdom of God and his kingdom being manifest in the earth. I didn't say church, I said his kingdom. We're talking kingdom talk. Since Abraham is considered to be our father, and since the Most High said Abraham was a friend of God, and since the covenant was given to Abraham and those that were his descendants biologically, as well as those that were of the uncircumcision that would come in from the coast of the Isles of the Gentiles. Since Abraham would be our father on one level or the other, hopefully for some of us on both level, biologically as well as being born from above, the question is, was Abraham wicked for waging war against the five kings who never bothered him? Was Abraham wicked for waging war against five kings and never bothered him? Should he have only prayed and let God handle it? For as black people that have learned Christianity in the West, that's what we've been told to do. No matter who wages war against us, no matter who kills our children, traffics our families, poison our waters, bring mosquitoes full of disease and put them in our yard and say they're doing a governmental test. Use something like Operation Paperclip to experiment on us with plutonium and to do many other sundry experiments around the black neighborhoods where they set up medical research centers as well as prisons. We are told all we need to do is pray and preach Jesus. I've already proven that that's not how the founding fathers operated. That's not how they operate now. That's why we're over there in Ukraine having skirmishes now. I don't believe everybody's gone from Afghanistan now. And if something breaks out and they start to fight in Iran, I'm sure they will, in, they will bring some of our children over there as they did the Vietnam War and other sundry wars. My question is, was Abraham war wrong? Because if we're the children of Abraham, are we never to be our brother's keeper? I told you we were going to talk about Denmark Vesey, but in talking about him, if I can establish that Abraham was right, or if I can't establish he was right, then Denmark Vesey, Prophet, Reverend Nathaniel Turner had no leg to stand on, either the Gabriel Prosser or many other men that have stood up for right and have been slaughtered in this country. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your wisdom. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to dig into your word and realize that whatever was written aforetime was written for my and our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And that we realize that all scripture, the ones they tell us to get rid of, to unhitch ourselves from, were given by your inspiration. It were breathed by you. And that they are profitable for our doctrine, for our teaching, for our correction when we're wrong, for our instruction when we need to know what to do. 
in righteousness so that we can be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I want to go ahead and share my screen. And in sharing my screen, I'm not going to go over everything that I've said because on YouTube, I have about five messages where I've built up to this. I have the same thing on Facebook. And those that like the message or don't like the message, share it. We, I'm, I'm willing to talk it over with some people. But I want to go directly into what we're dealing with. And since I'm saying this, and I've shown what the fathers did in my last message, I want to show this man. His name is Dr. Robert A. Morey. It didn't give me the image, but that's okay. Dr. Robert A. Morey. I own some books by this man, and I had told my computer to copy it, but due to the fact that it didn't copy it, I'm going to just pull him up from the web because I want people to see who he is because if a person don't see who he is, what will happen is they may think I'm making up stuff on my own, and that won't make it wrong just because I make it up by myself. But a lot of times I've found over the years that if somebody – that people think is renowned says something, then it seems to have weight. So let me give it a new share. Sometimes it'll let me do new share. It didn't let me do new share this time. So I'm having to go back in the screen share to do it, but that's okay. This man right here, Dr. Robert A. Morey, that's him. This is Dr. Morey. This is Dr. Morey. He is by no means a black man. Not only is he by no means a black man, he is by no he was he was he died recently. He was by no means a stupid man either. Uh, I would not have any of his books if he was stupid, except for the fact that he was so stupid, and I wanted to quote from his books. But this man, I pulled him up on my computer, and you see, I own forty-one books by this man and the man is he is very he's a he was a brilliant presuppositional apologetist apologeticist i guess if i can make that word he was an apologist but when he does the work i don't think the word should end in apologeticist i like that better if it's wrong then so what i'm pulling from his book so these are these are the kind of people that when I used to uh, listen to a lot of teachers, and I've told you about, told you all about Dr. Moorcraft, these are the people that when they came into America, because he's a Reformed guy, Presbyterian, they had Reformed Methodists, they had Reformed Baptists, they had what they called the Puritans, they would come over here and they were going to settle the land, they were going to civilize the people, they were going to make the people be able to know the Most High God insofar as how they taught them, and give them a form of Christianity that would make them docile and that would follow their teaching, okay? So this book that I'm showing you right here, I'm, I'm pulling from this book, it says, when is it right to fight? That's the name of the book. Because that book is dealing with something that's called just war. Just war. If you talk about just war, when is it justified to go to war? I, because of the fact many people don't use the word just as in justice, let's use the word righteous, righteous war. So he has listed in this book the first recorded just war. How do we get this to Denmark Vesey? I want to prove my point before I go through because I don't want to try to prove it from Denmark. I've already shown that this was done before Denmark Vesey. It was done before Prosser. It was done before the Reverend Nat Turner, okay? And you all know I don't like to call people Reverend and all of that, but there's some kind of respect I want to give that man for what he stood for. And if you think I'm wicked for doing so, prove it. All right, so let's look at Genesis 14. I'm not going to turn to it. I'm just going to read what he talked about it. If you want to know my thoughts on Genesis 14, I've taught the book of Genesis twice. It's on my podcast. It's seeking the truth. Dot pod p o d bean dot com. It's it's in the thing where my Facebook is. 
It says the first the first recorded use of force in a just war context is Abraham's slaughter of Chedorlaomer and the kings that were with him in the Valley of Seba, Genesis 14 and 17. I'll read that a little bit and you can see it. And it says, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer of the kings that were with him at the Valley of Seba, which is the king's deal. He won the war. The facts of the situations are quite simple and straightforward. And it, look, an invading army had defeated and looted Sodom and Gomorrah and had taken Lot and his family captives. When Abraham heard this, he armed 318 of his servants and pursued the enemy until they reached Dan. Notice this man is called an enemy. He has not attacked Abraham, but he has attacked another city, a more than one city. But one thing about that city, that city had Lot in there. Lot was the descendant that was left of his brother Haran that died. It was Abram, Nahar, and Haran. And Haran died, and Lot stayed with Abraham. So when they attacked that city, they took Lot. And Abram got up with 318 of his trained servants. Those are actually, no doubt, the ones that were circumcised in Genesis 17, but we're not talking about that right now. He divided his servants into two groups, attacking from both sides under the cover of darkness. Kedileamar was defeated and all the captives free. There are several important things for us to notice. First, Moses describes Abraham's actions with obvious pride over Abraham's demonstration of courage and love for his fellow man. In Moses' account, there was no sense of disgust or grief over Abraham's use of force. Second, there was no divine command given or needed for Abraham to know that his brother, there was no divine command given or needed for Abraham to know that his brother's keeper, he had lot to deliver. So as his brother's keeper, he knew what to do. It was obviously just and righteous for Abraham to use force in such a situation. Abraham was mature, you all. Abraham is making decisions like the founding fathers made. Abraham is making decisions like our Congress and Senate makes. Abraham is making decisions like our presidents will make. He's his brother's keeper. If he had stood idly by and refused to help Lot in the time of need, he would have been branded a heartless coward or a scoundrel the rest of his life. But the way that we have been taught as the people that were brought here as slaves, chattel, to be a labor force for those that wanted to sit and drink tea, smoke tobacco, to raise crop to ship back over to Europe and Spain, all over the world so that they could make profit. We were taught everything that is supposed to happen to us, we pray, we forgive. Actually, in the beginning, it wasn't, wasn't even that, it's that that's your place. God has made you to be this. You are stamped by life because you got a curse of Cain on you. That's what the Mormons taught. That's what other people taught. And then some said you have the curse of Ham on you. And we were taught to allow our brothers to be beaten, raped, our sisters raped, the babies born, sold, the daughters pimped, Anything that you own, search and seizure could take place at any time and be taken and your child could be raped in front of you and nothing happened. And we were to stand idly by because the lash with the leather whip, the four inch thick, I mean wide and half inch thick whip that sometimes was mounted to a piece of wood would go across your back, your head, your legs and your buttocks. And if you were a woman and pregnant, they would have a ditch dug out for your belly to lay in while they beat you. Abraham would have been 
if he had stood idly by and refused to help Lot, this man said he would have been branded a heartless coward or a scoundrel for the rest of his life. We were taught to be that. Third, some people have mistakenly thought that only wars in the Old Testament, which were directly initiated and commanded by God, can be viewed as just. All other wars might be viewed or must be viewed. I, I changed the word. All other wars might be viewed as sinful, so they must be. How can one respond to this idea? Listen to Dr. Morey. Consider Abraham, whose own sense of justice as the brother's keeper initiated the use of force. However, after he returned, God put his stamp of approval on Abraham's action by having Melchizedek, the high priest, bless him. We read about that. It's in Genesis 14, but we read about that in Hebrews chapter 7, where it says the less is blessed by the greater. The New Testament's approval of Melchizedek's blessing of Abraham and the fact that Melchizedek is viewed as a type of Christ prevents anyone from saying that Melchizedek's blessing was not a divine blessing. And that's given in Hebrews 7, Hebrews 7 1 to 3, chapters 7, verses 1 through 3. Fourth, it is assumed by some only wars fought in self defense are just. So I guess when you hear that, because that we weren't allowed to fight in self defense, it was illegal for you to raise your hand against a white man. If one day I might tell you about John Holes, I might show you the picture of John Holes. When, they, when, when the Atlanta Constitution was bragging about they were going to burn him, and after church, they took him out, and the young boys got together, and they got sticks and things, and they made a pyre. In other words, they made a big thing of wood so that they could burn him, and they tortured him for 30 minutes, cut off his ear, cut off his penis, held his genitals up in the air, burn him, and they took body parts and put it in windows of buildings. And that was the thing that changed the W.E.B. Du Bois from being an, what he was the uh, pr professor, I think, at Morehouse or one of those Atlanta University schools, and he became an activist. It says, it's assumed by some that only wars fought in self-defense are just. It would be immoral for one nation to attack another nation unless that nation is attacked first. How many wars have we fought in the United States and wasn't attacked first? Somebody's making adult decisions, and I'm just telling you. Somebody has determined they can make those decisions. And if you know your senators and your congressmen, or you know people that were presidents, and all that happened is they a big company, a big corporation, or somebody that had money decided we want to get this person on every radio station. We want to get that person on television. And we want to do the campaign, have them look right and say the right words. And they get elected. Does that make that person mature to make decisions of life and death for other nations? for other people, to take their property, to maim people, to do the same thing to our children. Does it ever come a time that we want to consider what does most high want? Are we ever going to be mature? Are we ever going to be able to, to discern between good and evil? Our master is like that. He says in 4 and 13 Hebrews, all things are naked, and open to the eyes of him to whom we have to do. We need to be able to be in touch with him. Listen to what it says here. For the problem with the above theory is that Abraham's use of force was not in self-defense. Kedileamor was not attacking him. Abraham was initiating the conflict by pursuing and attacking a tyrannical enemy. You get that? An enemy that had executed tyranny on the innocent. In light of this, it is clear that wars of aggression in which one strikes the first blow against tyrant 
can sometimes can be viewed as perfectly just and righteous. Not so with Denmark Vesey. Dr. Maury, as much as a lot of his information is really good, I never heard him say, with all of this knowledge, that tyranny was executed of, upon us Black Americans, native Black to this country, the descendants of the slaves, by the whip, by the chain, by, with the chains and the the locks around the necks and around the feet, marching 700 miles or more bare feet, the hanging and the lynching, the raping, the burning, the burning of our houses after President Woodrow Wilson allowed them to go forward with what they were doing during the time of reconstruction when they watched a movie called Birth of a Nation. The Ku Klux Klan in the name of Jesus, burning houses, taking property, raping women and killing, going in the houses, taking at our people, beating them. Listen to what Maury said was just when Abraham fought. It says, the problem with the above is that Abraham's use of force was not in self-defense. Kedale Amor was not attacking him. Abraham was initiating the conflict by pursuing and attacking a tyrannical enemy. In light of this, it is clear that wars of aggression in which one strikes the first blow against tyrants can sometimes be viewed as perfectly just and righteous. But yet Nat Turner, Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, were considered to be unjust. And even the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who would not raise a hand, was considered to be wicked by many. It is perfectly just and proper for a free world to go to war against Hitler in Japan. See how he mentioned Hitler? He's supposed to have killed six million Jews. You have the, Zion, you have the, Zion, the Zionist Jews, you have the religious Jews against the ones that are secular. You had Europeans fighting Europeans aggression against their own. Why didn't he mention Leopold, which killed 10 million black people and this is a white man doing it? Or why didn't he mention Stalin or Lenin? Because you didn't get to control the media. Our 10 million plus doesn't count. And Hitler killed many of our people, the Harato people. I just want you to understand, just understand narratives. But yet, what he's saying is true. He leaves out stuff. It was perfectly just and proper for the free world, talking about the United States, to go to war against Hitler and Japan. The UN was right when it entered in Korea to stop the communists. Who made those decisions? Did God come down and said, go to war against Korea. Stop the communists. I love the fact that you all have capitalism and that you all have founded capitalism on the back of stolen people, trafficked people, and slaves, that you have built your economy of tobacco, you have built your economy of rice, you have built your economy of indigo, you have built your economy of sugarcane, you have built your economy on the backs of people that were whipped, beaten, and starved. When surrounding African nations overthrew Idi Amin's re reign of terror, this was just and right. Due to the fact that when I see how he deals with our people, I have to I have to put a pause in that and go and look and see about Idi Amin and see if his reign of terror is what it was really said by people that lived there as opposed to the narrative that was given to me. Could be, may not be, but I've learned not to trust because I've found that we black people were, we had a disease, they call it, uh, it looked like dryptomania, dryoptomania, is that we had a disease of trying to escape our slave masters, okay? It says, the people of Grenada rejoiced when the united force of the Caribbean and the U.S. troops came into their country and delivered them from communist oppression. That doesn't make it right just because the people rejoice. But due to the fact you use the word oppression, if what you're saying is right, that was a good thing. But who came to deliver us? 
Should I forget about my people? Should I forget about Billy L. Merritt? Who was forced to work in Carnesville, Georgia? And should he escape? He could have been forced to go work in Alabama coal mines or turpentine field or go work at Chattahoochee Brick. Should I forget about his daddy, Darby Merritt, who didn't even have the same privileges as his son? Or shall I, shall I keep going back to the mirror till I get to Augustus? It says, I'm, I'm on the left panel. It can also be legitimately deduced from Abraham's example. Remember, I quoted to you all that whatever is written aforetime was written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Well, we still have oppression. And I did quote to you all 2 Timothy 3 and 16 that all scripture is given by the, by the inspiration of God and is profitable for our, our reproof, for our correction and instruction in righteousness. To be our brother's keeper is a righteous thing. We need to grow up and be able to discern between good and evil when we sit back, when we pray, when we talk, when we do whatever is necessary to keep peace. We grant that power often to police officers that many times care nothing about God's word. They care nothing about you as a black man. They care nothing about a woman. They care nothing about somebody poor. But it's a job. Some of us haven't realized yet that we are to stop being children and grow up. In the book of Hebrews, we're trying to put us in a position that we could judge the world. First Corinthians chapter six says that the saints will judge the world. Romans 13 is the job for the children of God to make peace. Then he say, blessed are the peacemakers. How can a man make peace that don't know what peace is? Read him. It shall also be legitimately deduced from Abraham's example that it was perfectly free, that it was perfectly just for the free world to use force when necessary and practice practical to deliver captive nations everywhere. Notice the ones Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Afghanistan, East Germany, Angola, Cuba, Central America, etc. Why not Congo? West Africa, Senegal, Sahara, even Liberia that they made, or the kingdom of Judah that was in Negro land in the 1747 Bowen map, Oweda as it was called. I understand you didn't write the book. Abraham's aggressive use of force to deliver his brothers from tyranny and enslavement justifies all other wars fought for the same reason. One of our greatest sins today is that the West is not more actively involved in funding freedom fighters everywhere from Cuba to Afghanistan. Well, we fought Afghanistan or in Afghanistan. The West is failing to be a good Samaritan. First of all, a Samaritan was not just a title. It was the name of some people that had bastardized God's word. It was, a, it was some people that were half breed. It was some people that when Israel, when we got kicked out of the land for doing what God had said for us not to do, they brought other people and the lions came and started eating the people. And then they brought in some, some priests to teach them about Yahweh in his name. Let's not, let, uh, again, just because I like a person's deduction and their arguments don't mean I got to accept every step of the way. Again, the term Good Samaritan is thrown around really nicely. But what is a Samaritan? When you learn about a Good Samaritan, you're going to learn about somebody that was should have been considered wicked, unjust, uncouth. And that person, by some will of God, had his heart right toward doing for his fellow brethren. And maybe that's what he meant. But I but I I don't like that term being used a lot of times by people that don't even know what it is. They offer it on TV a lot of times. It says the West is failing to be a good Samaritan to the poor and oppressed brothers who are being crushed under the heels of Marxist tyranny. Do you not think that there were people, Dr. Mori? I know you don't hear me, that were crushed under capitalistic Roman doctrine of discovery, doomed versus tyranny? colonizers, tyranny, 
UN tyranny, but just Marxist. Well, I mean, tyranny is tyranny. If the West would only follow Abraham's godly example, the communists would soon abandon their program. I want you to hear this. The communists would soon abandon their program for world, world Congress. The oppressed people in every communist country, if given the funds and the weapons, would rise up and overthrow their slave masters. You, you, you probably can't hear me thinking, but due to the fact that you can't hear me thinking, I'm going to let you see me think. I've quoted this before, but sometimes I need to show the irony of many of our Christian hearted apologists. Listen to Romans 2 and 1. Therefore, thou art inexcusable old man whosoever you are that judge if you judge that somebody ought to do something for people that's oppressed under Marxism and give them weapons and give them ability to fight their own fight so they can be free you judge it said for wherein you judges another you condemn yourself for that thou judges do it the same thing you, 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 what, what have you ever gave we black people so that we could rise up and be free and be free from plea bargaining and free from excessive bail, which you said in your bill of rights would not be and free from contaminated water and free from medical experiments and free from our children being taken and put into foster care. Or our men being lynched and you never want to do an anti-lynching bill. But who so you can judge America for not doing stuff for the Marxists, but it's okay for the Christian people to say, just preach Jesus. And you wonder why many black people don't want the Bible. Say, so, well, when you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you, the judges, do it the same thing, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them that do such things? Thinkest thou this, O Christian? O thinkest thou this, O evangelical? You can think about Marxists. You can think about war over there that's in Palestine right now. You can think about the war in Afghanistan, the Japan, Japan, Japan. You can think about wars in Afghanistan. You can think about the Korean War, but you don't think about the war that have been waged on black people here. And God most high is watching. And thinkest thou this old man that judges them would do such thing and you do us the same? The war hasn't stopped. That you shall escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? If you think that what I'm saying is wrong, if you think that what I'm saying, they're making it up, you have to learn what the theory of the lost cause is, that they believe that it was redemption, that they lost the war, and that God was going to raise up the South again, just like he raised Jesus from the dead and gave him power and authority, that he was going to raise up the South again, and that the South was just a martyr, and that the South has a just cause, and because they didn't treat their slaves and keep their slaves under subjection like they're supposed to be, that's why they won the law. I got the documents, and it's not written by a black man. If it was written by a black man, it'd still be true. But the time has come that many that have been the beneficiaries of the injustice done toward us say, you know what? I got to make my calling and election sure. I want to wash my hands. I may not be like Pilate, but I want to wash my hands and say they are not guilty of the things that we've done to them. So he says, but after the hardness of your impenitent heart, just preach Jesus. Don't mention this. Don't tell us our faults in America. Don't tell us what we've done to you all. Just preach Jesus. We're never going to make restitution. What we're going to do is we'll give you a half-hearted apology and we'll still keep the land that we took from you all. We'll still keep the thousands and thousands of hours of labor that you were not able to bequeath to, your, to their children or to our children and we'll keep it for our children and we'll still keep the laws on the book that keep us down as a permanent underclass in America. 
and benefit from it and let you rejoice in going up to heaven and you can get your shoes on, got on your traveling shoes and you can go up to glory where you can sing and shout and there'll be nobody there to put you out. Yet they can have theirs here and you can have nothing. But Christians, evangelicals, America, after the hardness of your impenitent heart, your heart that cannot repent, you treasure up to yourself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who would judge every man according to his deeds and to them who by patience continuous in well-doing seek glory and honor and immortality and e eternal life. This is one reason I'm telling the truth. Warn your enemies so that they can change. Warn those that oppress you that don't know that they oppress it so that they will know so they can change. Paul said, I oppressed the people of God, but I did it ignorantly. And when the Messiah said, Paul or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Yeshua, who you persecuting? And we know well, we should know the rest of the story. Let's go back to that. I'm going to read this little part again, and then I'm going to move on. It says, it says, communists would soon abandon their program for world conquest, the oppressed people of the Communist Party. If, if the people would give funds and weapons, they would rise up and overthrow their slave masters. Let us not forget the, in the Hungarian and Czechoslovakian revolts when the oppressed people rose up against their Marxist masters, they cried out to the West for military help. To our shame, the West refused to give them help. And the freedom fighters were crushed under the tracks of Soviet tanks. The sin of the West in not going to aid their brothers in distress is one of the most shameful and cowardly chapters in Western history. What about the slaves crying? the mother's breast filled with milk, the blood drenched ground, the blood drenched trees, the smoldering ashes of skin of black men crying out for help. And when the abolitionists come to try to help, they call them carpet baggers. You better get out of town, nigga, nigga lovers, nigga lovers, get out because if you don't get out, the same thing gonna happen to you called carpet baggers and when they would try to do right like John Brown you killed him but yet these people I guess what ends up happening is it depends on who you are well I would submit to you I could read it but I'm not going to read it the Bible teaches that the Messiah is going to come back and he's going to wage war and he's going to wage a just war not only that, he gave a parable one time that he had, he, a nobleman had a vineyard. He had, he had an area. He loaned it out to people. At a certain time, he wanted to get the goods from what he's done. He sent back a son. I mean, he sent back somebody. They beat that person, sent another one. They would beat him and mistreat him. And finally, he sent his own son and they killed him and mistreated him. And he asked the people, well, what would that, what would that nobleman do? He's going to send his people to miserably destroy those people. And the Messiah was using that picture to show what the father is going to have done to those that did that to his son. If we don't understand that the Bible has shown just war, you misunderstood what Hebrews chapter 2 was talking about when he took on the seed of Abraham so that he could be like us. So he could defeat Satan. That was warfare. He gave up himself in warfare to have the people destroyed or to have the, when I say people, I'm talking about spiritual people. Uh, you, we may not call them spiritual spirits. We might call them spirits, entities, but they are still personalities. And especially the devil. Let me give you an illustration of that. I believe it's the 16th chapter. It may not be the 16th chapter of Judges, but it's close to there. Once Samson's eyes were out and he couldn't see, he wanted, the, he wanted the pillars of the temple. And he got to the pillars of the temple. 
And he prayed for y'all for one last time to have his strength. And when he pushed those pillars down, I, uh, be careful with that arm, he pushed those pillars down. He killed more of the enemies of God, the Philistines, and his death than he had in his life. There are some times when life's a sacrifice to save others. There may be times in the war where they send out three or 400 men and they get killed at the front of the line and the other get to come through and save the lives of millions. Messiah offered himself to save us. That was a strategy of war because he was put to death illegally, a false accusation that was the cause of the defeat for the wicked one. Well, let me go in and just make you understand. These are some of the things that when I look at the scriptures, I'm looking at the scriptures saying we got to do better. We got to come to the place that we understand what was going on. So in the case of Denmark Vesey, what happened? This man had bought his own freedom. He won a, like a lottery ticket. And he was able to buy his own freedom. And he wanted to free his wife. But that wasn't enough. And he worked on ships. He studied and read the Bible. What I didn't like about him, but I don't even know if it's true, because sometimes people paint stuff and they will say like he had more than one woman. He was like a woman. As I don't know that. But I do know. He was in the scripture. I do know he wanted to free our people. And during this time, there was things going on by the abolitionists that were trying to be our brother's keeper. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't believe all of the abolitionists wanted to free us to make us equal. That was not in the Constitution. That was not in the Bill of Rights. And even this man by the name of Charles, I think it's Charles G. Finney talked about abolitionists, you get it wrong. Freeing a man from slavery doesn't make him equal to us. So just understand freeing us would have had a lot to do with making our lives better. But when laws are constructed that we will always be a permanent underclass. So even if we bring Ukrainians over here, they'll be over us. When Mexicans were brought over here, they were over us. When the Germans were brought over here, they were over us. When the Irish were brought over here, they got to be over us because the trades and the skills that we have, you, you make you make unions, you make trade, th trade unions and things like that, and you keep the Black people out, and you keep them from being able to get what you call the so-called American dream, okay? These, these are things that have happened that are very well, very much documented. But notice what what was said by George Keith. He was a Quaker, a Quaker, not an evangelical. He implored his fellow Quakers to reject the practice of slavery. Denmark Vesey was doing the same thing, teaching people God's word and saying they're not supposed to enslave us. Those that are doing that, they're going against God. They stole us. They should be put to death, said God's word. They keep us in slavery. They rape us. They kill us. They are worthy of death. It's not just about praying. They've declared war. And Denmark was saying these things to the people. He would say it to them in private. And the people that were doing it didn't know it. This is in Charleston, South Carolina. This is part of the mo great part of the multi motivation why Dylan Roof went there about two years ago and shot up the people at Emanuel Methodist Church. Okay. It wasn't just random. It was because here's a man that stood up and the mark is being made. Don't y'all ever rise up. Don't you ever try to protect your own. Don't you ever try to have a memorial like what we did when we put up memorials of Jefferson Davis and, and, and Grant and Lee, the men that wanted to keep you all down. We, we idolize that. We see that it's great. We put them on stained glass windows in our churches and put halos over their head. Yes, they do. Well, George Quaker, he implored his fellow uh, Quakers to re reject the practice of slavery because they were doing it. He argued that biblical law considers man stealing a far more serious offense than other types of stealing because it is punishable by death. So when somebody has the nerve to tell you all sins are the same, that's not true. 
look at what the penalty is for the sins and you get a chance to see how much heinous some sins like when you when you steal from somebody you add a fifth to it that's not death he says he contrasted exodus 21 and 16 you'll see that a lot notice what it says and he that stealeth a man and selleth him or if he be found in his hand shall surely be put to death that's not something that god was to come out of the sky and do I lost some sound. I lost some sound. Yeah, about about a bit. I don't hear you. The heinous death, I believe. That's you lost you after that. Okay. Let me see. It says I'll go back to it. Did I lose it on the conference line or did I lose it on the Zoom? Conference. Okay, it says, let me make sure that this thing is still going. It says it is one time. Okay, it says he contrasted Exodus 26 and 16, where it says, he that stealeth the man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. With the law that appears several verses later, Exodus 22 and 1, notice, if he... If a man steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five ox. That's what you work with. Five for one. Or four, four sheep, sheep for sheep. Yet, what he is showing is stealing a man is worse than stealing an ox. Stealing a sheep is less than stealing an ox. That's what he was showing. And it says, which in Exodus 21 and 37 in Hebrews requires a person who steals and then kills the ox or a sheep to pay back the animal's owner with five or four sheep. That's what I explained. Then it says that stealing, even killing the animal, is not punishable by death, Keith reads. Because if you kill an animal, then your animal gets to be killed. It says... Keith reason shows that perpetual bondage and slavery is done to the great scandal of the Christian profession. This is what they were doing as Christians. Then it says, Samuel Sewell connected Exodus 21 and 16 with the transatlantic slave trade directly, he wrote, and seeing God, he that stealeth the man, he says, seeing God said, he that stealeth the man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. Quotes the scripture. This is the this law being of everlasting equity. What he's saying is, is unlike our enemies tell us to divorce yourself and unhitch yourself from the oldest testament, or that you don't need to go to the Bible for your instruction. These people are speaking to their own people and saying, we got to stop. They're warning. And this man said it's of everlasting equity. What everlasting equity mean? Whatever the strength of that is, no doubt if it wasn't two sheep and it was two donkeys. Or if you had pigs, if you had a car, if you had a boat, the equity of the scripture is you got to do restitution. Are you following the man? If not, I hope I helped you. And it says everlasting equity wherein man stealing is ranked among the most atrocious capital crime, what louder cry can be made of the celebrated warnings in 1782, the French American author Hector J. Crevecor, I guess is how you pronounce it, Crevecor, pronounced uh, he published letters of the American farmer. I want you to understand this. Every time you hear of child trafficking, kidnapping, They've stolen a person. There are people that bring people here in other countries and say they're going to give them a job in America, and some of them are enslaved, even in this country. There are many people that are worthy of death in this country. And do we care? Most of the time we don't. Sometimes we don't know it. What am I showing you now? I'm showing you that they're going to let you know that there's a case for just war or for just for justice to be done according to our people and they don't do it. 
And I'm letting you see that there were some people that were giving them scripture, chapter and verse, but the evangelicals didn't care. I'm going to give you one on Jonathan Edwards. Listen, in his, in his sermon, Edwards argues, and I think this is Jonathan Edwards, the, the son, not the, the most famous one. In his sermon, Edwards argues that the whole Negro slave is a greater sin than fornication, theft, or robbery. When you see these numbers here, that's just that was the page number, okay? Theft or robbery. To support this claim, Edward quotes again Exodus 21 and 16 and comments, thus death is by divine express declaration the punishment due to the crime of man stealing, but there is not the punishment due to fornication. See, death for man stealing, but not for fornication. Sin is sin, but all sins are not equal. Death of robbery in common cases, therefore, we have divine authority to assert that man stealing is a crime greater, a greater crime than fornication and theft and robbery. A few months later, on January the 29th, 1792, Abraham Booth preached a sermon on Exodus 21 and 16. This was what was current. It says with a lengthy title, commerce in the human species. In other words, this is our commodity. This is the stock that we're selling. It used to sell us on Wall Street. This is the stock that we're selling. The commerce in human species and the enslaving of innocent persons inimical to the laws of Moses and the gospel of Christ. How is it just about 300 and something, year, close to 300 years ago, that these people understood that Yah's eternal laws and the equity was still valid. And now here we are in 2023 and they don't matter. Restitution, reparation is not due. Reading the scriptures are not due. And yet we still go and we fight and we determine somebody needs the death because they invaded someone, whereas our country was an invasion of life. The most high is watching because we can judge that others are wrong in doing it and we can do it ourselves. It says in this sermon, Booth, a Baptist minister in England who joined the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, interprets the reference to man stealers in 1 Timothy 1 and 10. For those that say that was Old Testament, Tim, 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 it doesn't matter. Just preach Jesus. Well, 1 Timothy is New Testament. The temple hadn't even been destroyed yet because Paul is writing it. Paul says, because he's coming from 1 Timothy 1 and 8, where it talks about the law is good if it is used lawfully. If a man uses it, the law is not made for a righteous man, but it's made for the ungodly. And then it gets to verse 10 to tell you what kind of people. Whoremongers. For them that defile themselves with mankind, that's arsenicotes. That means men having sex with men. It says for men stealers and for perjured persons. And if there be any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine. Where did you get the penalty from that? You have to go back to Torah. Well, somebody say, well, I don't go by the Old Testament. If the New Testament don't say it, I don't do it. Well, the New Testament said it here. But you know, the New Testament don't tell you not to have sex with animals. So are you going to say that that's okay? Or do we take the equity as they taught before the scripture and know that Yah still means the same thing when it comes to cleanliness and morality? It says, as an, it says 1 Timothy 1 and 10, as an example of man stealing prohibited by the eighth commandment. Booth proclaims man stealing is here classified with such crimes as the most detestable in the sight of God, most pernicious to society, most deserving of death by the sword of the magistrate that we read about in Romans chapter 13. It says, while 1 Timothy does not explicitly call for men stealers to be put to death, Booth finds support in Exodus 21 and 16. Of course, that's where you're going to get the information. The Bible don't tell you how to be reconciled to your brother in the New Testament. When you leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled to your brother in Matthew chapter, I believe it's chapter 5 around 23. It doesn't. You have to go back to the oldest Testament to see what the pattern is. 
It says, like Jonathan Edwards, the younger, Booth uses 21 and 16 to show how severe sin slavery is in the eyes of God. While not explicitly calling for the death penalty for those involved in the slave trade on the basis of 21 and 16, Edward and Booth appeal to biblical texts condemning man stealing. I hate when I lose my pace, as a part of the larger theological arguments that the entire slave industry is morally incompatible with biblical teachings. In other words, we know what's right, but we're not going to enforce it. We're not willing to put any skin in the game other than just say the words. Vessi was different. Booth explains that both selling, the sellers and the buyers of, buyers of human beings are implicated in a moral crime. As the man stealing himself deserves to die for a strategic crime, and the purchaser, let me go. The purchaser of those who become the victims of his greed cannot be counted innocent. Innocent, far from it. Denmark Vesey, by contrast, pursued the implications of Exodus 21 and 16. He that stealeth the man, and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. Denmark Vesey, by contrast, being the victim, being the one that's under this, being the one that suffers this, being the one whose parents, being the one whose loved ones, being the one whose kindred all around is being killed like this, like Abraham looking and seeing what was going on, he pursued the implication in a more radical, notice the word radical, why are you using the word radical? How about righteous? In a more radical direction, with real world consequences. The trial of Vesey's alleged associates continued after his death on July the 2nd, 1822, according to the Hamilton account. John Enslow gave his first confession on July 13. Unlike many others implicated in the plot, John was not sentenced to die. He was the sentence to imprisonment in the workhouse of Charleston, talking about Charleston, South Carolina, until his master, under the direction of the city council of Charleston, should send him out of the limits of the United States in which he could not return on the penalty of death. In other words, you were involved in a plot to execute righteous judgment on the wicked, but you're the one that's banished. But if you come back, we'll put you to death. Isn't that amazing? It says, after John's conviction, he gave a second confession detailing how Vesey planned to carry out the insurrection. He provided information about planned meetings. Listen to this. Denmark had several meetings at different times. He generally opened by reading the 21st chapter of Exodus, which is left out of the Unholy Slaves Bible that they sent to the British West Indies, okay? This is, I told you all when they made that, that was something they had already been practicing and they were able to go ahead and put it in a codified or what we call a book form by reading it's this 20, the 21st chapter and exhorting them from the 16th verse, he that stealeth the man or selleth, if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. He says, it was not uncommon for enslaved witnesses to refer to or at least allude to biblical text throughout the trials. But John's quotation of 2116 is entirely the instance in any of the trials, notice, is the only instance of any of the trials transcript where a witness quotes the Bible text by chapter and verse and claiming that Vesey used the Bible to justify his plot. In other words, they didn't keep a whole lot of records of the trial that we have access to, okay? In the end, John's confession did not save his life while he was in prison in the, in the workhouse waiting for his banishment. He died of an unspecified cause. You know that stuff still happens today? Sometimes they die on the way to the courthouse. Sometimes they die on the way to the jail. Sometimes they're hanged in the jail. Sometimes, uh, despite the slaveholders Joseph Enslow claimed that the aforementioned slave when put under confinement was healthy and an able-bodied person. But unlike this man named Bourne we talked about the other day and other anti-slavery clergy, 
This he was not interested in making a theological argument against slavery. He saw the Bible as commanding God fearing to take action to punish the perpetrators of slavery. Isn't that what Dr. Morris said should happen? Didn't he say that, that you should be at least giving money to those people that would fight, giving them arms so they could fight? Isn't that what John Brown was doing? But there are people that hate John Brown. Born said back then, and he's talking about what Vesey and Vesey said. He saw the Bible commanding. So Born is saying it's wrong, but Vesey say commanding to take action. So the Bible talk about fornicators not inheriting the kingdom of God, homosexual not inheriting the kingdom of God, idolaters not inheriting the kingdom of God. Is God just telling me this to know it, or is He telling me this so that I will abstain from it? Why is it when it gets to this part, we don't see application? Because our heart has grown dull and waxed. We have an impenitent heart. We won't repent. Because for exchange for our soul, we want the wealth that we have generated. Thousands and thousands of acres of land and thousands and thousands of free hours of labor that you didn't have to pay for. Read, Tim. He saw the Bible as commanding God, fearing to take action to punish the perpetrators of slavery in his community. This he identified with the ancient Israelites. Notice this. Way back then in seven in the 1790s, and this is around 1822, this he identified with ancient Israelites of the Old Testament. And Kennedy and Parker note in all of his conversation with others African descent, he identified their situation with that of the Israelites. For Vesey, the Bible enjoins its readers to take on the role of biblical characters and to act as they do. Is that, isn't that another word for application? It is. In other words, the Bible does not simply provide its readers with moral edification. Living biblically means enacting biblical laws which requires the killing of the white slaveholding population in Charleston and the surrounding areas. As Vessis saw it, Charleston was an example of a city facing severe and divine ordained punishment. Now, when a person sees this, they say, oh, that's oh, that's bad, that's bad. But I read that all that Dr. Morris said. I've read all that the American founding fathers have said. I go to Wikipedia and look at all the wars that have been in the millions of people that have been put to death. And no, where are the complaints? Who determined that those wars would be? And why would this man be considered wrong when you know who your enemy is? How, how you do, man? How, how you do, boss? How you do, mass? How? Read them. He says his intention was to make the white pro-slavery clergy. Did he say all white? The white false prophets, dumb dogs that won't bark. The white pro-slavery clergy in Charleston admit that they had concealed texts like Exodus 20 and 16 from enslaved people. Isn't that beautiful? That he was looking out for his people. Wasn't it beautiful that he knew what they were doing? And then he said, this, and he was showing it. Well, look at this. It says, July the 5th, 1822, Mary Lambal Beach acknowledges that Vesey knew that a local minister named Benjamin Palmer, this is the man that Dr. Moorcraft, whom I used to get information from, a smart man. He praised this man. I didn't even know who he was. But his name locked in my brain. I looked him up. Yeah, I did. And now look at what it says. A local minister named Benjamin Palmer. It's two Benjamin. One, I think, is the daddy and one is the son. Or the grandfather and the grandson. Either way, same people. Same spirit. Had met with some of the gentlemen in our church and made a catechism different for the Negroes on the night of the insurrection. And I've given you that way. You know, I'm, a, I'm not worthy of anything and I'm just a Negro and and being just a Negro, I'm not worthy of living and the stuff like that, okay? He made one just for the Negroes, for them to live. 
And it says, on the night of the insurrection, the plan was to confront some of the clergy with biblical texts, with like Exodus 21 and 16, as Bacchus put it. And let me scroll the page. Mm -mm, scroll for Tim. The pages that alluded, alluded to was the 21st chapter 16 verse in Zechariah chapter 14, where you go through and you see they're going to fight against the enemies of Yah and going to destroy the enemies of Yah. And he taught, he used those scriptures. And then it says, Kennedy and Parker do not explain why Vesey intended to demand the explanation of Exodus 1 to Isaiah 19, where Yah comes and fight against Israel in Isaiah 19 from the white clergy members. It says, it was a prophecy condemning Egypt and promising a severe divinely inflicted punishment before the land of Egypt is redeemed. Kennedy and Parker explained that the relevance, the, the relevance of Zechariah 14 and 3 and Joshua 6, 21 and the introduction, introduction of the official report, they claimed that these two texts were among Vesey's favorites because they talk about killing the enemies, leaving no children, leaving no posterity, getting rid of all of the enemies of y'all so that they could be peace on earth. And so they are calling him the enemy. And so part of it said, they shall be divided in the midst of thee. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle and their cities, look, and the city shall be taken and the houses and the houses shall be rifled and the women ravished and half of the city shall go forth into captivity and the residue of the people shall be cut off from the city and the Lord will go down and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Zechariah 14 through 3, Zechariah, Joshua 6 and 21 is a much shorter and it comes from the world's known story of Joshua and the Israelite and the conquest of the city of Jericho. Well, the point being made is this. Are we our brother's keeper? Are we mature enough to know that loving the most high God means there are sometimes we got to protect. There are some there are sometimes that we talk. There are sometimes restitution is made. But there's sometimes that we have to defend our loved ones and property and the saints of the Most High. If we don't ever think on these terms, we will always be treated as children. We will never grow up. When Messiah came, he came to defend or be his brother's keeper. He came to wage a just war. We're supposed to be his soldiers. You may not see it, but the Bible calls us, he calls him the Lord of hosts. He calls him Yahweh Sabaoth. Are we going to grow up? Are we going to always be afraid? And the Lord really depend on us to do what's right by him? Or was Abraham wrong in defending Lot? Was he wrong? Was Nat Turner wrong to defend the people when you take his wife and you give her to another man and you see this man has impregnated your wife? When you don't want to get married because the master would take your wife and he'd have sex with her or kill your child or kill your mother. And that you would see them bringing in people on ships. So in 1808, when they stopped allowing to bring uh, ships of slaves in, the people would go around, they go around the south of Virginia, they would go around the southeast part of Virginia and, and go around and get to Louisiana. And they would sell them there. Was he wrong? The real question is if you see that he wasn't wrong, or there are not times that we have not put our lives on the line for our brothers because we wanted to live. Are we cowards? When the time comes and saints, it can come at any time. Are you willing to do God's will? If God wants you to stand and take it like the Christ did because you're being accused of something, are you willing? 
if the time comes you have to protect your wife and your child, are you going to do it? What about this child? What about the little child walking up the street and you see somebody grab the child? And the child is screaming and hollering. Somebody beating up somebody elderly. Do you do you not get involved? Or you know, you think about the consequences. I might go to jail, they might take my freedom. Somebody in his gang or his family might come back and attack me. When is the time? These are these are decisions that mature ones have to make. If you have to go get help, you have to go get, get help. But these are decisions. It's not just about doing liturgy and singing. Are our women safe in our assemblies? Are our children safe in our assemblies? I guarantee you when you go to some of the evangelicals of one, the same people that are the descendants of the ones that kidnapped and raped us and still got our properties. Because, you know, they built Southern, they built Southern, um, the Southern Baptist school off of slaves. They sold slaves to buy that, okay? People that own the plantation did that. Go read about Manly. They'll defend that. You walk up in their place, don't ever think that they're unarmed. Don't ever think it. Well, when I tell you that the time come, we ought to be teachers. We need to be teaching our people we have to grow up. I taught the book of Numbers and the Most High God took part of the Levites and made them a military army. Yes, he did. You could go touch the tabernacle and be uh, be put to death. You could defile the tabernacle and be put to death. You could go and blaspheme the name of God and be put to death. Because the Most High is interested in preserving life. I know this is a hard, somber message, but people are making these decisions anyway. Afghan war, Korean war, policemen, National Guard, when they determine that they won't let you, if you live out there in Louisiana, um, Katrina, we're not going to let you go to the white side of town and get water or to get shelter. Those are life and death decisions. Are we ever going to be able to make those decisions? Are we ever going to get our mind right to the time, the time comes for us to rule that we know how? Is this Bible that we read just a joke? Or is it a pattern? You decide. You decide if you want to if you want to look at the pattern. I showed you on Sabbath, I'm not gonna read it today. All of the judges had to make those kind of decisions because y'all raised them up. You don't have to volunteer to be in there everything, but you should have your mind set if I have to. Some people, they used to call this man named John McCain a war hawk. But he didn't have to go fight no more. It's in other people. You know, people right now to do that, they get money, take resources from people. Venezuela had all that oil. Look at them now. Broke. Saints, you keep wait, we keep waiting for a rapture. I'm not one of them. We keep waiting for a rapture. And the Most High God is looking to see if he's going to find faithfulness on the earth when he comes back. Let's grow up and start letting the world fill our judgment. And I'm not talking about going out and doing what? I'm talking about the words. The words will make them attack. The words will make. But don't go out here and you, you, see, you see our people willing to to fight and do wars because somebody say something they don't like. Or somebody mess with one of somebody's girlfriend, he got three or four. Or somebody tell a lie on somebody. But for a righteous cause, we, we don't really want to move. These are the decisions that mature people make. These are the decisions that people make when they get into government. Senators vote on it. Congressmen vote on it. Presidents do things. Sometimes they are told to do things by their corporate sponsors. And yet we say we're the people of God and we never see men like Denmark Vesey, 
prophet Nat Turner, Gabriel Prosser, John Brown, men that stood up for us as righteous. And yet we'll say Abraham was righteous and the Messiah is righteous. We got to do better. We got to grow up. These are the mature things that has to happen. If we don't do it, rest fully assured, somebody else will keep making those decisions for us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for allowing us to realize that this world is full of evil actors. It's full of those that will take our freedoms and our lives and do things to us that ought not to be done. And they can enforce it by the power of armies that they can get away with stuff. And if we do righteously, they can lock us up, take our lives. Father, help us to realize that the time has to come that we have to say, though they slay me, yet will I trust you. Help us, I pray, in the blessed name of your holy child, Yeshua, Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. And even so, amen. I now open this class for discussion if there's any to be had. If I was clear, that's great. If I wasn't clear, I'm sorry. But there was so much that I could read and I don't, at a certain period, it's time for me to tell the story and stop reading. I'm open if there's any to be had. Well, I thank everybody that joined me tonight. I want you all to keep Tim in your prayers. May the Most High bless us and keep us. Make his glorious face to shine upon us and be gracious to us and cause us to grow up in every way that we would reach the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Christ and be no more children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine and slight and craftiness of men whereby they lie wait while I in wait to deceive. Help us, I pray. Amen. Amen. And even so. Bless his everlasting name. Amen.